And please silence your cell phones and refrain from taking flash photographs. And don't forget that uh, upstairs after the talk will be a book signing, so please join us. My name is Kalela Williams. I'm the Director of Neighborhood Library Enrichment Programming here at the Free Library of Philadelphia, and I'm also a, yeah, <laughs> I'm also a devoted amateur historian. In the year of the bicentennial of Frederick Douglass's birth, and on the eve of a tragic anniversary, the 400th year since enslaved Africans arrived in Jamestown, Virginia, Frederick Douglass's life's work resonates keenly. I encourage you to view a special exhibition that explores the legacies of both Douglass and W.E.B. Du Bois, opening here at Parkway Central Library next month. But tonight, I am honored to introduce Dr. David Blight, who will talk about his new book, Frederick Douglass, Prophet of Freedom, which the New York Times says, treats Douglas as a man, not a myth. In the world of biographies, those are highest compliments. Dr. Blight has been on the faculty of Yale University since 2003 and is currently the director of its Gilder Lerman Center for the Study of Slavery, Resistance, and Abolition. Among the numerous publications he has edited, annotated, and or written introductory essays for are both of Frederick Douglass's autobiographies as well as American Oracle, The Civil War and the Civil Rights Era, W.E.B. Du Bois's Souls of Black Folk, and Caleb Bingham's 1797, The Columbian Orator, a book of abolitionist writings that inspired Frederick Douglass as a young man. And Blight is the author of Frederick Douglass's Civil War, Keeping Faith in Jubilee, a book of essays, Beyond the Battlefield, Race, Memory, and the American Civil War, and A Slave No More, Two Men Who Escaped to Freedom, Including Their Narratives of Emancipation. Blight's book, Race in Reunion, The Civil War in American Memory, was the recipient of eight book awards, as well as four awards from the, American, from the Organization of American Historians. Blight is a frequent book reviewer for the New York Times, the Chicago Tribune, the Boston Globe, Slate.com, and numerous other publications. He's been a consultant to several films, including Death and the Civil War and Africans in America, which are two of my favorite PBS documentaries. If I listed all of Dr. Blight's accomplishments, we would seriously be here all night. But I will say that before contributing immeasurably to African American historical scholarship, Blight was a high school teacher in his hometown of Flint, Michigan. Everyone, please welcome to the stage Dr. David Blight. Wow, thank you, Kalela. Thank you all for coming. Um, let me first say, maybe every speaker who comes here says this, but uh, there's no place I love more than public libraries. I mean that. And I've been on an extensive book tour. I don't know. I think I'm in the seventh week of it. But, and no offense to the Free Library of Philadelphia, but my favorite stop among all the places I've been so far is the Flint Public Library in Flint, Michigan. <laughs> because that's where I grew up. I literally grew up in that building. And I think we had at least 30 people that night. <laughs> but it doesn't get any better than public libraries. I, in fact, I have this crazy, crazy idea. It's too apocalyptic, actually, and it's actually depressing. But if we knew the world was ending, you know, we knew we had a week or something. Oh, we won't, but if we did, we should all just gather in, in libraries. I mean, this one's huge. I mean, just gather in libraries, have an open bar, <laughs> and just go through books. No, all right, <laughs> sorry. I'm gonna talk about this book and I'm gonna talk about Mr. Douglas. Um, we are living in interesting times, to say the least. Um, everywhere I've been with this, there is a, a constant kind of uh, either question or um, suggestion, at least, that Douglas's life and his ideas and his words can speak to us. Um, and they do. And I have a long list I've been making of the ways they do, and I'm happy to come back to that in questions. Um, 
But he said this in 1864 in the midst of a crisis. Those were interesting times. Horrible, horrible, terrible times. This was February 64, if you know your chronology of the Civil War. Uh, the war is still more than a year to go, but nobody knows that. The war is by no means won yet for the Northern or Union side. The horrific summer of 1864 is yet to come. And Douglas wrote, I quote, the most hopeful fact of the hour is that we are now in a salutary school, the school of affliction. If sharp and signal retribution, long protracted and overwhelming, can teach a great nation respect for justice, surely we will be taught now and for all time to come. A school of affliction. And he said that's hopeful. It really was kind of Douglass's worldview, even his view of history, even before the Civil War broke out. Please listen to just four lines of, from the first chapter of Jeremiah, because Douglass was an American Jeremiah. Uh, Douglass found great wisdom and also fear, probably, in the Hebrew prophets, the Old Testament prophets, especially Isaiah and Jeremiah. They were his favorites, at least those are the ones he quoted the most. I've actually done some counting. But it reads in Jeremiah 1, Behold, I have put my words in your mouth to pluck up and to break down, to destroy and to overthrow, but to build and to plant, to wipe out and to remake, to destroy and to rebuild. If you can keep that, that, that terrible juxtaposition in mind, you can actually understand a lot of Frederick Douglass's rhetoric. I want to get that off of here. That's just advertisement. I'm particularly fond of this photo. Let's deal with the photos quickly, if we can. I, I only have a half dozen or so images here, although there's so many of them. Uh, many of you may know by now, and perhaps even own, and I highly recommend, uh, a new book, or a book that may be three years old now, called Picturing Frederick Douglass, uh, edited and compiled by three good friends, um, John Stauffer, Zoe Trod, and Celeste Bernier. They did the intrepid work to try to locate every extant photograph of Douglas, and then lots of other images, Douglas in cartoons and on murals and so forth and so on, both in the 19th century and into the 20th. But they have argued, and they, you know, they probably are right, that Douglas is the most photographed American of the 19th century. And if that's true, and it probably is, why? <laughs> well, one answer is you can get kind of by looking at him. He's a pretty stunning fellow. And he loved having his photo taken. <laughs> and they love taking his photo, that is, photographers. There was a mutuality about Douglas's uh, creation of photographs, and this is what the photography historians, of course, teach us that the subject of the photo can also be part of the creation of that photo, and rest assured, Douglas was. If he didn't like the right profile you did of him, he'd make you do the left, and then he might make you do it over again. Everywhere he went, local photographers wanted him to sit, wanted him to, to come for studio photos like this. And one of the reasons he's so photographed, without question, I think, is that he traveled so widely, so often, I argue, in fact, in the book that he may be the most traveled, I mean, there's no way to know for sure, nobody kept any exact statistics, but he may be the most traveled American of the, of the 19th century in sheer distances and miles, with the possible exception of Mark Twain. But Twain cheated and he went to Asia. 
So, yeah, it's not a fair fight. But everywhere he went, he had photos taken of him in all sorts of small towns, various places, all over the northern United States. This one was taken in Hillsdale, Michigan. It's still a small town. It has a little college. And it was taken in the third week of January, 1863. That's three weeks after the Emancipation Proclamation. Douglas has just gone on the road. He's out in Michigan by then, January. I grew up in Michigan. I know January is in Michigan. Back-breaking speaking tours, year in, year out, way into his old age. He's still doing it the, the year he died. Thousands and thousands of miles, three- and four-month lecture tours, speaking on an average of at least every other day. And any author who complains about his or her book tour should just read about his itineraries and those sooty trains and those terrible stagecoaches and those horse carriages. But uh, he was on the road at this point with a speech called The Proclamation and the Negro Army. A real turn had come in the apocalyptic war. More perhaps on that in a moment. But go with me to September of 2016. I don't know if any of you watched it or pulled it up on YouTube or read it, but in the speech that President Barack Obama gave at the dedication of the new African American History Museum in Washington, where I just was two days ago for a, a memorial for our dear friend Ira Berlin, um, Obama gave the dedication speech. He's, here he is, the black president of the United States, dedicating the Black History Museum right in the center of the mall. What a moment. And it really was one of his very last public addresses. I mean, he gave lots of campaign speeches after that, before, the, before that election. Um, but in this one, he opened in that first paragraph with these kinds of expressions. He said he wished to deliver what he called a clear-eyed view of a tragic and triumphant history of black Americans in the United States. He spoke of a history, he said, that is central to the larger American story and one that is both contradictory and extraordinary. Clear-eyed. He likened the African-American experience to the what he called infinite depths of Shakespeare and scripture. I love that line because uh, no African American, I don't think, embodied the rhetoric and used the rhetoric of both scripture and Shakespeare quite as much as Douglas. He owned three complete works of Shakespeare. He owned interpreter's guides to various books, especially of the Old Testament. The embrace of truth, said Obama, as best we can know it, is where real patriotism lies. And then naming some of the major pivots of the country's history, Obama wrapped his central theme, these pivots and clear-eyed view, he wrapped his central theme in a remarkable sentence about the epic of the Civil War era. This was Obama, and it's, it's in the very opening of that speech. We have buttoned up our Union blues to join the fight for our freedom. We've railed against injustice for decade upon decade, a lifetime of struggle and progress and enlightenment that we see etched in Frederick Douglass's mighty Leonine gaze. Now, I know that's presidential rhetoric, dedicating a museum, but the speechwriters speech writers had a good afternoon that day. And he must have worked with them, of course. And what was he reaching for there? He could have chosen lots of people. He could have chosen Harriet Tubman as his first image. I mean, she's everywhere now, except on the bill she's supposed to be on. <laughs> that hasn't happened in this administration. Could have chosen Rosa Parks. He could have, yeah, King, Du Bois. I mean, you know, he could have chosen, but he chose Douglas. I've never had a chance to ask him why, but I did have the thrill of being asked to sign a copy of my book for Obama for, by the person who's running his new museum and library. And I, 
I actually practiced the inscription like three times <laughs> on a pad. No, I didn't want to. I didn't want to make any any mistake. I just practiced and practiced and practiced, and then I put it in the book. You know. If you know him, don't tell him that. <laughs> but I just find it interesting. He chose Douglas. All right, in quick strokes. Douglas was born Frederick Bailey on a, a little horseshoe bend in the Tuckahoe River, probably in his grandmother Betsy's cabin uh, in February of 1818 on the eastern shore of Maryland, a true backwater of the American slave south. Uh, he was a little nobody slave child from nowhere. He didn't really know his mother. He had to invent images of her. Um, I mean, he last saw her when he was five, but the times he saw her were very rare. Uh, he never knew who his father was, but his father was in all likelihood one of his two masters or two owners. He's always told that. And he spent tremendous energy the rest of his life trying to figure out his paternity, to try to know who his father was. And I mention this because one of the first facts you should know about Douglas, particularly to understand his emerging temperament, personality, his tendencies, his hypersensitivities, his lack of trust at times for people, is that he was an orphan. He's a true orphan, always in search of possible parental figures or mentors or somebody he could trust particularly mother figures, if he could find them. But he grows up uh, 20 years a slave, about 11 of those years on the Eastern Shore in, 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 in two three different stints, including time as a genuine field hand, including vicious brutality and whippings and beatings. But he also witnessed uh, a terrible array of, of, of treatment, of beating of savagery committed by overseers and owners on slaves, on women, on children, on old men. But Douglas always maintained, he said this over and over and over, that to him, the worst part of slavery, and nobody in the 19th century analyzed the meaning of slavery to the enslaved. I mean, partly because he became such a genius with words, but nobody analyzed that meaning quite as well as Douglas. And he was always saying that the worst part of slavery was its mental and emotional and psychological humiliations. The physical treatment was bad, horrible, and left its many scars, but he said he always felt like he could somehow protect his body better, better than he could his mind. And that may indeed have transferred into his writing and may indeed be a, a, one of the many things that make his writing so compelling and so lasting. Because many, many people have probably had the same experience of worrying most about what, what might happen to their mind rather than to their body. Although both really matter. Um, the greatest thing, the greatest luck he ever had in his youth, and then I'll get past that, is, of course, going to Baltimore. And he spends about nine of the 20 years as a slave in a city. If it hadn't been for Baltimore, we wouldn't even know Douglas. If it hadn't been for Baltimore, he would never have developed the kind of literacy that he did, the kind of love of language, the collecting of newspapers. He'd have never found the Columbian Orator, that amazing little book. It's actually not that little that he discovers as an 11 or 12 year old, he discovers his white buddies, his white friends, all these immigrant Irish and German kids with their school book called the Columbian Order and he wonders what is that? And he tells us he would trade warm bread from Sophia Auld, his mistress, for spelling lessons and then he wanted to see the book and read the book and then he actually bought his own. With a little bit of money he managed to save up from the jobs he did. If it hadn't been for Baltimore, we wouldn't know him. If it hadn't been for Baltimore, he wouldn't have been able to live within and around the free black community of Baltimore. I mean, it's worth knowing that in the year he escapes in 1838, Baltimore had about 130,000 people. It was a huge ocean port city. 
and the world sort of came into Baltimore Harbor and he saw the maritime world and he worked in the ship uh, building yards in Fells Point. But he was one of about 3,000 slaves in that, that large ocean port city, but there were 17,000 free blacks in Baltimore. There's a large community, huge free black community. That's where he met Anna Murray, who would become his first wife. That's where he got involved in four different churches, actually two black and two white. He names all the ministers in his autobiographies. He tells us which ministers he liked and which ones he didn't, which is the same thing people do today with their ministers and churches. He meets, uh, he got involved in a debating society. Field hands didn't get to do that. And he met an old black preacher named Lawson, Charles Lawson. Probably when he's about 12, 13. Lawson was a sort of partially literate drayman by day. He drove a cart to try to make a living. But he was a fanatic about the Bible. And he just wanted to read the Bible. And he found this kid who could read so well, and he sat him down. Imagine if you're 12 or 13, and this mysterious old man wants you to read out loud to him. And for days on end, when they had time, Douglas would sit with Lawson and just read the stories of the Old Testament out loud. Did he understand them? No. Do you? Most of them? I mean, uh, the Old Testament's full of confounding great myths and stories of all kinds. But the way this young kid, and then teenager, and then young man, got language in his head, which will become the greatest, we the only real weapon he will ever have, is by reading out loud, hearing out loud, over and over, the King James cadences and language of the Bible. And to understand his rhetoric, it took me a long time to, oh, to get my head around this, and I still don't think I do. But to understand Douglas, you have to understand how he came by that language. And he's coming by it before he ever escapes from slavery. All right. I wanted to just establish that, lay that down. Now, he became, with time, and I, I want to stress this. What I want to get to in a moment is just, I'm just going to sort of name them, and then maybe you'll be interested in reading the book, or maybe not. But I'm going to name uh, six big themes that hold the book together. But I want to say a couple other things first. Two, I would never have written this book, backtrack a moment, I would never have written this book were it not for the flat-out blind good luck of encountering a private collection of Douglas manuscripts. It's one of those things that happens to historians because we just are in the right place at the right time or we get in the way. Uh, on a day in, uh, turns out, 2006, I had thought it was 10 years ago until a week ago I went to Savannah to, for a big celebration of the book and my host reminded me, no, it's 12 years ago, so never trust your memory. Um, I went there to give a talk on Douglas's narrative to middle school and high school teachers, which I've do, done many times. My host was the Georgia Historical Society, and the heads of the Georgia Historical Society said, there's a local gentleman here in Savannah. He's a collector. He'd like to go to lunch with us afterward. Is that all right? And I said something like, ah, uh, yeah, OK. And I went to lunch, and I met the most extraordinary man. And I, every talk I give, I give him credit where credit's due, and you'll find that the book is dedicated to him and his wife. His name is Walter Evans. Walter grew up in segregated Savannah. He's an African-American retired surgeon who went north uh, for his higher education, medical school at the University of Michigan, practiced for 35 years as a general surgeon in Detroit. And I knew surgeons could make a lot of money, but my God, he plowed his into African-American rare books, manuscripts, and art. He's most famous for his art collection, but his manuscripts are unbelievable, too. That day, he took me over to his house after lunch. He got out on his dining room table a major portion of his Douglas collection, which he'd been collecting since the 1970s, when it wasn't so expensive to buy these kinds of things. And that day, I encountered 
this amazing possible window, especially into the last third of Douglas's life. Douglas is born in 1818. He doesn't die until 1895. He lives 30 years after the Civil War. If Americans know Douglas now from growing up in new curriculums, uh, from reading, they tend to know the younger Douglas. They tend to know the heroic escaped slave who writes a narrative in his 20s, you know, writes his way into history, and then you know, becomes the heroic orator. And maybe they know that he was a big voice during the Civil War. But they, most Americans don't tend to know much at all about the older Douglas, the aging man, the patriarch, with three surviving adult sons, one surviving adult daughter, 21 grandchildren, at least three fictive siblings that he adopted or who adopted him from slavery days, and a whole array of other hangers-on, all of whom became financially dependent upon him. They don't tend to know the... Uh, old radical outsider who becomes the political insider, the bureaucrat in Washington, D.C., the holder of, of two major appointments from two presidents, uh, the insider in the Republican Party, the infighter in the Republican Party, uh, the, 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 the aging great Douglas, uh, sort of the head of black America, who now has a whole array of, of young black leaders, the next generation always trying to knock him off, which is what generations do to each other. And all of those young guys have been to college, colleges like Oberlin and Harvard and many others. And they wanted to knock this guy off his pedestal, and he threw more mud back at them than they threw at him. We don't tend to know this aging, complicated, modern, conflicted, complex Douglas. The Evans Collection, the heart of it, are about 10 huge family scrapbooks that were kept by principally by two of Douglas's sons over the last 30, 35 years of their father's life. Thousands upon thousands of newspaper clippings. The family by the 1880s hired a clipping service. I didn't even know there was a clipping service in the 19th century. It was called the American Bureau. And everywhere he went, clippings came back from wherever he spoke. And now you can get texture. You know, a biographer always wants a little texture uh, from here or there, a little context for this or that. I have hundreds of examples of people writing in the press or being quoted in the press saying what it was like to see Douglas speak, what it was like to hear Douglas for the first time, and so what he looked like, and on and on and on. And much, much, much more. A lot of family documents in the Evans collection, photographs, and include, I mean, there's so many things that the Evans Collection opened to me, but it also includes two fairly short but very important handwritten narratives by two of his sons entitled Growing Up in the Douglas Home with, with very revealing material about what it was like being his son and Anna's son and what Anna was like, their mother. So... Without having encountered that collection, I would never have written this book. I had put Douglas out of my life. I wrote my first book on Douglas, which was a dissertation decades ago. I edited his you know, autobiographies. I wrote lots of essays on Douglas. I did the Columbian Order, and et cetera, et cetera. But I had Douglas gone, finally. And then Walter Evans got in my way. I mean, I'm grateful for that, although there were times along the way when I wished maybe I'd never gone to Savannah that day. Um, I've spent many, uh, I don't know, four or five spring breaks in Savannah and lots of other weeks. It doesn't get any better doing research than just being told, don't come before 8 a.m., but the coffee will be on. Stay as long as you want. And I did all my research there on their dining room table. It's a nice archive. They own a four- or five-story brownstone on Jones Street, two blocks off Forsyth Park in Savannah, and the house is absolutely chocked full of rare books and archive boxes. It shouldn't be there. It should be in a major archive. And the Beinecke Library at Yale made him an extraordinary offer for it about four years ago, and he wouldn't take it. He believes it's worth more than they offered. Collectors always believe that, I think. But anyway, all credit to Walter and Linda Evans, without which I wouldn't have even 
and wouldn't have even thought of doing it. All right, I want to say a word about Douglas's uh, contradictions, the complexities, the ways in which you can't, though we always want to, fit Frederick Douglass and many other leaders from the past, heroic leaders, men or women. We want, them, we want them to fit in the box we want them to be in. We usually want them to stay heroic and useful to us. Why have heroes if they're not usable? Why have heroes if they're tarnished? Well, this was a complicated fellow with a long life. Think about the length of the, think of the trajectory of this life to begin with. Born in 1818, before steamboats are virtually anywhere on, in ports or on rivers in America, before the railroad, before the telegraph, before the rotary press, all of, all of those elements of modernity, early 19th century modernity, he is going to build his career on and become a great journalist. But he's going to live all the way to light bulbs, the first telephones, the phonograph, amazing steamships that could cross the Atlantic in like eight days, nine days. He was, he was enthralled with steamships. Well, who wouldn't have been? I mean, you know, it's like, remember your first airplane ride? Well, maybe you don't, I don't know. Um, and phonograph, you might be wondering, why wasn't he recorded? Good question, but he wasn't. At least no one's ever found a recording. And I don't think he was recorded because about three months before he dies, he wrote, writes a letter one night after going to dinner at a friend's house in Washington, the man's name was Anderson, he wrote a thank you letter after dinner, you know, something nobody does anymore. <laughs> well, maybe you do. But he writes this thank you letter, but the letter was almost entirely about having heard a phonograph recording at Mr. Anderson's house. And he had heard a recording of a friend of his, a minister named Weirs, who had been recorded, a sermon. And Douglas was just blown away. It was the first time he'd ever heard a phonograph. And he writes about it as a divine invention. He goes on and on effusively, and he says, could it be that the human voice could live forever? And you hear him speaking about himself there. But if he had been recorded, I don't think he writes that letter. Now, why somebody didn't sit him down in that last year or so of his life and record him, I do not know. But if any of you have found a recording of Frederick <laughs> Douglass, talk to me first, please, if you would. But just... just a quick array of the, of the kinds of challenges a biographer faces, but they're, they're the fun of biography, too. They're, they're the problem and the fun. Douglas had a love-hate relationship with America. He loved its creeds. He loved the Declaration of Independence, the four first principles, and would always refer to them. He loved the Bill of Rights, well, at least most of it. He wasn't fond of the Tenth Amendment. That's the one about states' rights. <laughs> but he also had times when he absolutely hated his own country and said so. When he came back from England in 1847, having experienced this incredible flowering of his own personality and his own talents, he'd gone to England with his first autobiography in hand. He went to Ireland, Scotland, and, and Britain. He first arrived in Ireland, where they fell in love with him, and then into Scotland, where they went crazy over him, and they wrote songs and poems about him. I mean, he's 27 years old, and he's being treated like a conquering hero in this ang Anglo world. But when he came back to America in 47, because this is where his family was, and this is where his world was, he came back arguing explicitly I have no country, he would say. I have no patriotism. My country doesn't accept me. I don't accept it. It actually even became a refrain in one of his speeches. I have no country. I have no patriotism. He was such an angry black man when he got back from Britain in 47 and into 48 that some of his fellow Garrisonian abolitionists, like Wendell Phillips, took him aside one day and essentially said to him, Frederick, God, tone it down. One newspaper reporter, in fact, it was a Philadelphia paper, called him the demagogue in black. 
which is wonderful if you're, if you're a biography, you think, ah, that's a chapter title, thank you. <laughs> it just depends on when you look. You, you'll find Douglas as a, as a radical patriot at times, and then you'll find him saying things about his own country that will sting, and they were meant to. Um, he could be a proponent very often of self-reliance. He preached it all the time in his early career and especially in his later career. He was always arguing that black folk needed to learn how to be self-reliant. They needed to build their own institutions. They needed to imagine their own schools. But at the same time, he was an without question, an advocate of activist, interventionist, federal power. First to destroy slavery, then to destroy the Confederacy, then to establish civil and political rights for his, his people, then to create a new constitution in the 13th, 14th, and 15th Amendments, and then he hoped, against hope, to enforce those revolutionary changes in the Constitution and to protect freed people on the ground in the South. He believed in government. At the same time, he preached self-reliance. What do we do with that in our own time? The right wing in America, part of it anyway, the libertarian right, the Cato Institute right, love to appropriate this self-reliance rhetoric of Douglas. There's a, a book that just came out last, last winter called Self-Made Man, funded by, promoted by the Cato Institute, saying that Frederick Douglas can be boiled down to, and in his essence, was a limited government conservative who believed in individualism. I wrote an op-ed in the New York Times uh, saying essentially that that missed something. Uh, like 90% of Douglas's life as an abolitionist. And I don't know, I'm, I'm not important enough because nobody at the Cato Institute's ever attacked me back and I don't get it. I have fed them so many fat pitches and they just don't, and I'm, I'm, I'm absolutely certain I didn't convince them. And then sometimes the left appropriates Douglas uh, and makes him what they want him to be, who, who, whichever part of the they you want to look for. Um, he, could be a, he could be such a voice at times of compassion and just humanity and a kind of a expansive humanity. And he was for anyone enduring any kind of oppression, including the Irish, at least the Irish in Ireland. He had two different relationships with the Irish, the Irish in Ireland and then the Irish he encountered in the streets of New York. But at the same time, he was that person of compassion. When the chips were on the table, he became one of the most vicious war propagandists America has ever produced. When the Civil War broke out, he created the horrible Hun out of southern slaveholders, and he advocated their slaughter. He even invented all kinds of untrue stories about what Confederate soldiers were doing to dead Union soldiers. He was a vicious war propagandist, which reflects a lot of the rage he still had in his own soul against slaveholders from his own experience. Now, on the one hand, Douglas hated mob violence. Uh, he got attacked by mobs all the time. Uh, he was never shot, but he was certainly injured. He broke his wrist in a brawl in Pendleton, Indiana in 1843 with an anti-abolitionist mob. Uh, he was attacked over and over and over with raw eggs and brick, they always called them brick bats, but that meant any kind of rock or projectile you wanted to throw at people. And one, one time he had a live pig thrown at him, which must have been the badge of honor in abolitionism. Have you had a, have you had a live pig thrown at you? No. But at the same time that he hated mob violence, through the course of the 1850s, and partly because of his relationship with John Brown, but not solely, he began to shoulder up to possible kinds of revolutionary violence. The possible use or incitement of slave insurrection, 
although Douglas always was terrified of anybody who was even implying slave insurrection because he knew that the results of that were never good. He was fascinated with John Brown and fascinated with his plans until he realized where that plan was to take place, Harper's Ferry, the largest federal arsenal, and he bowed out, but he came close. You can't put him in boxes. He's an ironist. He was always looking for the this and the that, the this side and the that side. And above all else, Douglas learned how to transfer from being the radical abolitionist always beating on the doors from the outside to a political pragmatist trying to find a way in. And if you're looking for a model and example, there are many of these, but if you're looking for an example in the 19th century of a radical reformer who works with the only weapons that they had, which is the printing press, the voice, and the pen, but who becomes enthralled with politics, including political parties, who becomes enthralled with political ideas and becomes enthralled with political philosophy and then political action and learns how to shoulder up to people he does not like because he has something politically in common with them. Douglas is your prototype of a learned political pragmatism. Oh, Lord, I could go on, but I won't. Uh, and then, well, one last set of contradictions or paradoxes, if you want. Um, it is the way in which he had to find to balance the public and private aspects of his life. A radical advocate of women's rights and women's suffrage in public in almost every way he could have been. He's a speaker at the Seneca Falls Convention. He signed the Declaration of Sentiments. Um, he went back to Rochester on his new newspaper, The North Star, and put the, put the masthead, right is of no color or sex. He became very close with all the major leaders of the women's suffrage movement. He believed even in women's economic rights in the 1850s. He absolutely believed in women's equality. And yet he lived in his private life uh, a very difficult marriage to Anna, who remained all of her life largely illiterate uh, for reasons we don't entirely know, but I try to quiz out a little bit in the book. Uh, he, he got tutors for her, their daughter Rosetta served as a tutor at times, so did other people. He lived in his private world um, with a wife who was never really part of his public, intellectual, um, reform career. She virtually never traveled with him. There's one major exception. She went over to Boston to see her two sons drilling in the 54th Mass at Fort Meigs before they came to Boston to have that famous march and shipped out to South Carolina. Anna was not gonna let her sons go in that blue uniform until she actually saw them. But I can't find, there are almost no, well there are a couple, there are virtually no other examples of her traveling with Douglas in this constant itinerant speaking career that he had. Now part of the reason of course is she's always raising children, five of them. Although by that time of the Civil War, uh, they were all adults. And the whole family went to war. But he lives this very difficult, troubled, but hugely important marriage with Anna. He's raising three sons and a daughter, actually two daughters, although Annie, the 11-year-old, died in 1860. Anna's namesake. Uh, a horrible blow to the whole family. But he lives, a, he lives a public life that almost involves no mention of his private life. And in his 1,200 pages of autobiography, three autobiographies, actually four, he revised the third one, there's only one mention of Anna, and she's called my wife. 
there's very little mention, well, there's considerable mention, actually, of his second wife, Helen Pitts, because they did an 11-month tour of Europe together, and he loved writing about that. There's very little discussion of his children in the great autobiographies, which is to not diminish them. They are masterpieces. They are masterpieces of the American memoir tradition. But he doesn't talk about his sons and his daughter much at all. He expresses pride about his sons serving in the army. Not much else. So he's got to live this stark contrast all the time. And he's got to live that dilemma and that burden that they're all so dependent on him. His sons had a very difficult time through their adult lives, getting jobs, keeping jobs, building careers, having professions. Uh, one of his sons did pretty well. The other two did not, and are always having problems. And his daughter, who had the best education of all, Rosetta, she was the oldest. She had a much better education than her brothers. And she, for a while, she became a teacher, which is about the only profession open to women. But then she made a bad marriage, and there's no other way to put it. She married a, a former fugitive slave Civil War soldier named Nathan Sprague, who was what my mother probably, no, I know my mother would have called a ne'er-do-well. Uh, he just couldn't keep jobs. Uh, he was always wandering off to go somewhere to look for jobs or whatever he was doing. And she had seven babies with him in 13 years. And it shaped Rosetta's life. It also gave the Douglases an amazing array of grandchildren. Uh, the trouble was about half of them died in infancy or by their teenage years. And they were always holding funerals at Cedar Hill, always. He never writes anything about that. You have to find that by other means. OK, uh, I'm going to quickly run through with you, and I've already mentioned in many ways most of them. But I want to give you a sense of how I did what all biographers, what all historians do. I, try, I boiled down all this material, and he left us a lot to work with. Douglas wrote and spoke millions of words, 1,200 words of autobiography, hundreds and hundreds of editorials, the short-form political editorial. He mastered that genre as well for 16 years, editing his own abolitionist newspaper. And then there are the thousands of speeches which he's probably most famous for, most of which he wrote out in text. He wasn't just the, the sermon maker who could get up and belt out the lights off the top of his head. He could do that too, but no, his speeches are scripts, careful scripts. And by the post-war years, they're in typescript, most of them. So words are the first theme, and I weave it throughout the book. Words are the only weapon Frederick Douglass ever had, and words are the reason we're here even talking about him. Were it not for what he wrote and spoke and recorded, we wouldn't even be discussing him. That he became such a genius with language is the reason we know him, and it will always be the reason. It will always be the reason he's taught in schools. It's the reason the narrative is now taught all over the world. It's the reason the narrative became a leitmotif in uh, Chimamanda Adichie's amazing novel about the Biafran Civil War in Nigeria called Half of a Yellow Sun, a, a stunning book. And I've never had the personal chance to ask her, although I'm looking for it, and I noticed a poster of her in the back, so she spoke here. I can't wait to ask her, why did you, how, why did you put Douglas's narrative into this book? I mean, I have, I need to know. I have to know. Words are our first theme. And, and that starts when he's very young. The second big theme are the autobiographies themselves, and I'll be very quick with that because what you find is every, the biggest problem every biographer of Douglas has ever faced is that the subject is always there getting in your way, imposing himself on you. 1,200 pages of it. Don't trust anybody who writes 1,200 pages of autobiography if you're the biographer because they're, they're manipulating you on every page. <laughs> and they're doing it really well. But you've got to use them. So you've got to write about the autobiographies at the same time. They're a source you use. Without question, you use them. 
And thankfully, we've had uh, others have been there before me to do the kind of nitty gritty research on the Eastern Shore in particular, where Douglas grows up as a slave to verify so much of the detail in those early autobiographies that therefore show us that he's not making all this up. Well, parts of it may be embellished, of course. Any great autobiography is a work of literature. It's storytelling. And this guy could tell stories. Whoa. So the autobiographies have to be used and also written about as the subject. Why did he keep writing his own story? Why over and over and over? Why did he have to keep telling his story? Why did he seem to believe that he only had one story to tell? And that was, you know, me. And why doesn't he let anyone else into that story? Especially his family. Third big theme, <clears throat> which I signaled at the beginning, and I'll quick with this one too, but it is just how deeply steep Douglas was in the Bible. I'm waiting for the review to come out by a theologian who's going to take me to pieces. It hasn't happened yet. I've been very lucky with reviews. At some point, maybe the other shoe will drop. I'm not inviting it. Don't <laughs> go off and call your favorite theologian. But Douglas did come by language, as I already said, from the King James cadences and the King James flow of style. And there were many times in the writing of this when I really wanted to have, I'm serious, a full year off to do nothing but read theology so that I could understand this man. I didn't have the year off, but I do have good friends who are theologians, and I like to name them because they were so important to me. One is Don Shriver, who used to be, who's now in ailing health, but he's still very much with us. He used to be uh, president of Union Theological Seminary in New York, and uh, Don knows everything in biblical studies. <laughs> and one time I asked him to have lunch, and I said, Don, I need help on the Old Testament. Uh, and I asked him an entirely stupid question. I said, uh, <clears throat> what do I read on the Old Testament? <laughs> and after he got done laughing at me, he said, well, <laughs> you got to read Walter Brueggemann. He wrote 30 books, but read these two, and then read a little of this and that and this and that. And he was right, Brueggemann was a huge help to me to get my feet with Old Testament storytelling and the frames and shapes of the Old Testament. And then I made a very close friend of a, a rabbi in New Haven named Jim Ponet. He used to be head rabbi at Yale University. Uh, Jim retired and then he used to attend lecture classes. He used to sit in the front row in my lecture course on the Civil War period. And then we'd talk afterward and we'd go have lunch and he realized my dilemma I was having with Douglas. And uh, so he said, David, all right, here's what you got to read. Uh, read Robert Alter, read this, read that, but most of all, read Abraham Heschel. Whatever you do, you've got to read Heschel, the great Jewish theologian, 20th century. And in particular, I dove deep into Heschel's book called The Prophets, uh, the first 60 pages of which is a chapter where Heschel tries over and over to define a prophet. And among the many definitions Heschel gave to a prophet is this one. The prophet is human, said Heschel. Yet he employs notes one octave too high for our ears. He experiences moments that defy our understanding. He is neither a singing saint nor a moralizing poet, but an assaulter of the mind. An assaulter of the mind. There are many other passages like that in Heschel when I, I woke up and I realized, mm -hmm, that's Douglas. That's the way he uses language. He had that ability, that uncanny ability, as Heschel says, to find language, to explain a catastrophe, a pivot in history, a disaster, a triumph, a dilemma, a problem a problem so deep no one believed they'd ever solve it, and yet find the sentence or find the paragraph that just blasts you between the eyes and you sort of wake up and say, oh my goodness. And sometimes it's words that make you hurt, that assault your mind, make you fearful. You don't like it. It's Jeremiah. And what's the greatest story of the Old Testament? What's, what's the essential story of the Old Testament? 
but the story of the necessity of the destruction of Jerusalem. And some of the people will survive into an Egyptian exile, and some of them will survive and make it to Sinai and get the law, and some of them will survive that long period called Babylonian captivity. And some of them will just buy into the Babylonians, and some of them will even survive and maybe, maybe, just maybe get with Joshua to the promised land. It's Exodus in all of its derivatives. Douglas loved that story, but so did millions of other 19th century Americans. But what Douglas did with it is he found himself in it, metaphorically. And then he found his people in it, the American slaves, the new Israelites. And then he found his nation in it. And good God, the United States had been called the new Israel and the chosen country, or as Lincoln said, the almost chosen country. Uh, for years and years and years, Douglas came of age around language, hearing language, reading language, especially among abolitionists that were using this story. He made it his own. So if you put the word prophet in the title of your book, you've got to be ready to defend it. It's an awfully big word. We shouldn't throw it around. A prophet doesn't mean the person who predicts things. Prophets are often wrong. They're supposed to be now and then. But they're supposed to make us think. So, you'll find in this book, Douglass's use of the Bible woven all the way through. He's still quoting from Isaiah in the last speech of his life. A fourth big theme, which I've already mentioned, and I'll do these quickly, is he's that radical outsider who takes a crooked path to being the political insider. And what happens? What kind of compromises? What kinds of co-optations happen to an old radical outsider who becomes the political insider? What happens to principles? What happens to values? What happens to rivalries? What kind of psychic dilemmas does that cause for the old radical who's now the political insider? That's a big theme in his life, and it's there for decades of his life. Fifth is how in the world he found that balance between the public and the private. It's, it's one of the hardest things in biography. It's your biggest challenge. How much of the private life do you go into? How much of it can you go into with your source material? And when you have source material, what do you do with it? How do you make judgments about a 23-year relationship he had with a German woman named Otilia Assing? That's a teaser if there ever was one. <laughs> How do you make judgments about an uh, extremely important lifetime relationship he had with an English woman named Julia Griffiths, who became Julia Crofts by marriage, who spent six years with the Douglas family from 1849 to 1855 and became Douglas's co-editor of his newspaper, his chief fundraiser and emotional support. His, his personal editor, surely, helped him learn how to spell better. How do you make judgments when most of your sources are from them and not from him? And last but not least, a big theme in this book, and it has to be, is Douglas the intellectual, the thinker. The thinker in political philosophy, the thinker about the Constitution and about law. Some of his speeches on the anti-slavery interpretation of the Constitution are still taught in uh, law schools. There are no less than three books that have been published in recent years on Douglas as a political philosopher or a political thinker written by political theorists. Most of them are arguing that Douglas became a great proponent of and, and an analyst of the natural rights tradition. They're right, there's any question about it. I've written a lot of stuff about how Douglas was a kind of a theorist of memory and how collective memory forms, how nations and peoples and groups develop stories and narratives and memories and then fight over them in the public. He was a great journalist. He had lots, he's got a lot to teach about newspapers and journalism and that short form political editorial craft. And there are many, many other elements of Douglas as a thinker. The job of a biographer is to find a way to weave all those together and not lose you. 
the worst thing you can do in a biography, I think, is, well, okay, here's the chapter on Douglas as a political philosopher. Here's the chapter on Douglas and his marriages. Here's the chapter on Douglas and his sons. Here's the, no, you've got to weave all of these things together at once. And there are times when you have to remind yourself of that. Oh, dear. I haven't mentioned Attila Yassing in this chapter, but she's still there. All right. To end, I just want to end with a simple little line by Douglas. It is one of my favorites. Everybody has their favorite Douglas quote. I put this one on a T-shirt. I didn't bring it tonight. I'm not going to show off. But in the very last sentence of his long-form masterpiece, which is his second autobiography called My Bondage and My Freedom, a book that he lands right there in the middle of the 1850s. It's published in 1855. So he's writing it in 53, but especially in 54 and early 55. You know your chronology of American history. The Fugitive Slave Act and the Fugitive Slave Crisis, the rescue of fugitive slaves has been going on now for three and four years. Uncle Tom's Cabin has just been published in 1852 and taken the world by storm. The Kansas-Nebraska Act was just passed a year ago, and it is, it is tearing apart the American political party system. Bleeding Kansas has just broken out, the border civil war in Kansas. The slavery crisis is roiling the country. He plants this masterpiece of a more mature memoir right in the middle of that. And it's a much more political autobiography than that first narrative he wrote 10 years earlier. And what audacity to write your second autobiography when you're only 37. <laughs> Have you written your first yet? But he had political purposes in writing this. He also had pecuniary interest. He needed money. And Bondage and Freedom is going to sell 18,000 copies in the first year out. That's good. In the, that's good now, <laughs> much less the 19th century. But the book also has an almost, almost a light motif about potential violence in it. <sighs> And it's why some literary critics have said, bond, my bondage and my freedom belongs there in the middle of that cluster of great works we call the American Renaissance. Melville, Emerson, Early Whitman, Hawthorne, and a few others. But the last sentence, and I'm slightly paraphrasing, he says, as long as heaven allows me to do this work, and by that he meant abolitionism, printed, spoken, however, as long as heaven allows me to do this work, I will do it with my voice, my pen, and my vote. My voice, my pen, my vote. Now, he was lucky to vote. In New York State, a black man had the right to vote if he owned, is it 200 or $250 worth of real property. White men did not. Douglas owned his home thanks to Julia Griffiths, who bought the mortgage. My voice, my pen, my vote. That is all Douglas ever had. From 1841 to 1877, he never made a dime any other way than with his voice, his pen, and his vote. And unless you have great wealth or you're elected to high office, it's all any of us have today, a pen, a voice, and a vote. Thank you.